So we want to start just a little bit with, uh, um, with an opening a prayer. And so, Bob, would you pr- open for us a prayer, brother? Lord Jesus, thank you for this day, for these good men. Thanks for giving us laughter and self-deprecating humor and uh, time together. You know, you've blessed us so much in this country. It's unbelievable. So thank you, Father, for that. And help us to uh, abide in your will. Thank you, Father, for sending your son to beat the death on a cross for us. Thank you. He rose from the dead. And if he didn't, where's the bar? Amen. Amen. Well, I want to talk a little bit about sacrifice, and we'll share, we're going to share the time together. I'll open it up with some thoughts. Bob, you can come on up here and join me, too. Um, so we talk about sacrificial living sometimes. What does it look like? Yeah, well, whatever. It doesn't make any difference. Come on up here. Yeah. Um, are all you guys married? Yeah. So... Uh, there be, might be a period in time where you're not having sex or you haven't had sex for a while. We just, Bobby's just saying that there was a, a guy that had had sex with his wife for eight years, and I'm thinking, wow, that's a, that's a, I'm not doing that. That's a hard thing for me. I, and but there are other ways that we understand sacrifice in relationships. Maybe your wife is sick and you withhold and you don't press that. Maybe. There are opportunities for us to really become intimate with each other. And so often we think because we're, we might be in a crisis that we're alone and we're not able to kind of be part of a deeper relationship with our wives. Not about this, not a marriage session, but I'm, I want to make a point to all this. So when I was a chaplain with the New York Yankees from 91 to 2003, there was a player, a wonderful player. He came up and he was a star right away. And he was a Christian. He loved the Lord, and he was a 28-year-old phenom, 27-year-old phenom, and he was a Christian. And he was a virgin because of his own dedication to Christ, and it was his desire. That was how he was supposed to live. Well, he met a girl who also had the same mindset and also was a virgin. They both were 28 years old, and and so they got married in the, out in the West Coast, and it was a great wedding, and so on the night of their on the night of their honeymoon, as they were to consummate their marriage, she gets sick. They rush her to the hospital, and she has second degree cancer in her ovaries. She's starting to throw up. Her life is starting to become out of control. The, the next day, they take her eggs and freeze her eggs because she's going to have to go through radical treatment. Well, she goes through all this therapy. 22 months later, I get a call from her. She said, BJ, this is Sarah. I said, oh, Sarah, how are you? She said, well, I'm feeling really well right now. And do you think that my husband might wait another month until I get strong again before we make love? I said, I think that's going to be fine. Now, there was all sorts of sacrifice that went into that. Her husband bathed her, took her to the bathroom, changed her diapers, never once seen her naked prior to marriage. There's no greater love than this. So I'm thinking that in crisis, we understand friendship. In crisis, we are to show up in each other's lives. Addiction is about a crisis. I get that, I understand that. So Bob and I, we didn't know we were meeting in crisis, did we, Bob? So we were playing rugby together right. about 40 years ago, 35 years ago, something yeah. like that, right? Yeah. 84, 35 years. Yeah, 35 years ago. Yeah. So I was playing in the first side game. and we No, both I was in the first side game. No, you're right. That's right. Excuse me. Yes. Get this right, BJ. He was playing in the third side. No, <laughs> He played in the first side game. He played first, right? Yeah. Played first. So I played in the second side game. I'm, I'm older than he is, right? So I get kicked out of the game. Some guy comes up behind me, clips me under my chin, chips a tooth that I can still feel today. I turn around and I crank this guy, right? Because it was a cheap shot. Well, the referee saw me and threw me off. So he's thrown out of the game. It's hard to get thrown out of a rugby game, right? It's hard to get thrown out of a rugby game. So, um, because you could get the guy, you could have got him later. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So uh, I'm doing, 
I'm honest, honest, you said rugby, right? So after you finish a game, you're drinking right out of the gate, right? And do a coconut. I used to have this little sippy cup that kid did. I would put an ounce of cocaine in it and just grind it up and have it in there. Just, so we snort the cup. We called it Orange Crush. It was an orange cup. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm doing it on the sidelines, and he gets thrown off. So I'm like, hey. And they go, that guy's a priest. <laughs> and I'm, so I'm, I don't care. He's playing rugby. So uh, he was meeting us where we were. <laughs> so I, um, he gave me a card. BJ actually had a card. So this is 84. And uh, at that point, I'm working. I'm out of Columbia, Columbia Business. I'm Mayor Koch's labor relations director. I'm like 26 years old. And I'm whacked like four, four nights a week and just functioning, right? So uh, I went to his church the next morning with a brutal hangover, and I was... They were into it. It was the Lamb's Nazarene. Ironic, it was a Nazarene church in Times Square, which is a very conservative church in the heart of when Times Square was bad. Process. Not Disneyland. Yeah, it was bad. And, I, and I'm not saying anything macho about it. It was freaking bad. Right? Was, yeah. New York had a couple thousand murders. It was Fear City. Now it's like a giant Starbucks. It's one of the safest places. And so, I mean, I'm like, my sons went to Columbia to, to exercise my demons. And... <laughs> You know, they just did it right. So, which is a healthy. We didn't have any girls. People don't realize when I was at Columbia, it was all guys. Yeah. And so now they have. You like, did manage to find a couple of girls yeah, somewhere. Yeah, it's like more normal. So I go to the church and I can't believe it. And people are into it, calling for the fair catch when they say it. <laughs> and, uh, and then everybody ate after this. And I always remember this that there was, so there were prostitutes there and there were families with little kids, like normal, normal people. And, Black, white, Latino, everybody. So it was like church like it ought to be. I hadn't experienced that growing up a Catholic church. We were the Irish Polish church. They were the Italian church. They were the Spanish church. So, uh, and it was pretty good. And I was watching Denny Rule. Paul Moore was pastor. Yeah. Mike DiDorano. All right. So a bunch of guys who were college graduates. They could have been doing something, making a lot of money, and are serving Jesus. And I really didn't know what the, you were talking about. But I couldn't get past what they do. In the book of James 1.22, it says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Just If you're ever trying to lead somebody to the Lord, and have them read James. Right. It's just four and a half pages. If you have ADHD, you can bang you can get through. <laughs> it's great for me. And it just kind of says it all, right? So I started to go, doing my Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde thing, to the Lamb's Church. And we were working with kids who were the, uh, Mike had a big program with yeah. kids Mothers were prostitutes. They were from the SROs, the single room occupancy houses. And I didn't understand the Christ part of it, but I couldn't get past what these guys were doing, how they were living their life. So, um, uh, you know, it was really... And he was not an addict or anything, though. Yeah, I'm just using, just doing a little bit. Just, just a little bit, enough to balance. I'm only getting off. high drinking four days a week, yeah, not seven true. days a week. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so I get invited by these BJ... Brad Curl, a bunch of guys to go to the presidential prayer breakfast in Washington, President Reagan. Yeah, right. And they were going to go fellowship the night before. I didn't even know what that means. So I said, BJ, give me my ticket. I'll meet you there. <laughs> so I went out drinking in Washington. Like, I'm not an alcoholic. I just don't know anybody in that city. And I went out drinking. So I'm stoli and orange juice, right? Maybe a little absolute in orange juice, two at a time. Big bar, a lot of bouncers, no people. All of a sudden, it gets packed. Maryland was playing North Carolina. It was in College Park. So somehow I'm in College Park from D.C. Like, I don't know. So I'm standing there. Kids stole the purse. Very crowded bar after a game. Sports, you know, screens. And uh, this bouncer, I saw it like it was yesterday. Long-haired white kid, and he just kicked him right in the face. And so I hit that. Like after 10 drinks, I'm Spider-Man at this point, right? <laughs> So I just had that guy, broke his nose, then a guy broke a Heineken bottle, went to stick it in my face, and I went right through my hands. I got a Heineken bottle stuck in my hand, beer mugged him, grabbed the chandelier because I think to kick the next guy because Clint Eastwood does that in the movies. <laughs> but they don't, if you weigh over 90, they don't hold you. Like, this would not hold you. So I got a chandelier in my chest. The law term for that is uh, malicious destruction of property. <laughs> and um, two guys in an ambulance, I'm handcuffed, bar. $100,000 bail, assault with a tenth of main battery, and two days later, what's taking you so long, man? <laughs> he and his guy, he didn't have no money, so he had Brad Crow, Pat Ruane had the money. Yeah, right. So he found a wealthy Christian guy and they bailed me out. Right. And so, uh, so you need 10,000 cash. 
which you could forfeit if the guy doesn't go back for trial. You guys know that. Hope you ever build anyone out. So, and then I, so I pray to receive Christ with BJ and Brad outside of that. And honestly, BJ, if you were Hindu, I would have done that. Whoever built me out, I think. <laughs> so uh, I didn't have it. You could slowly come to Christ. I think you don't have to. It's not that lightning bolt thing is great, but I think you could work your right. work your salvation mm-hmm. to try to understand it because obviously I didn't fully understand it. And then I come back to New York City, pick up the phone, Dave Vitiello, my old drink. I'm like, this guy looks like Richard Gere. He's still good looking. I want to strangle this guy. <laughs> so I'd hang out with him just to get his like a left arm. So I go, I quit drinking. I'm like, he goes, no, no, wait. Uh, I quit. I'm going out and meet some guys tonight. Why don't you come with me? And so I go meet him at, at 79th Street Workshop in Alcoholics Anonymous meeting in New York City. And I, I'm in an AA meeting by mistake. <laughs> not knowing I was going to an AA meeting. So I pray to receive Christ in the morning and end up at AA that night. He totally disconnected. He didn't know Dave. So and then I got into it, right? Made a, we, you know, I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood him. And so for me, that was in the person of Jesus Christ. And then I really started to study it to basically try to be a Columbia University asshole, try to disprove it, right? <laughs> Because these guys wrote this 2,000 years ago and it's withstood the test of time, but I'm going to disprove it. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't. So, right? And then I ended up in Bolivia with Father William Wilson. I go, so, on a, I go to Bolivia for two weeks, vacation. Usually I go to, I go to a place like you were going. Like yeah. this great plan that you have, good idea. Yes. Go to good. a all you can drink free yeah. place. Oh, yeah. Good inclusive. idea. Great. Right. Right. All inclusive. Come on. Bro. Perfect. So I didn't go to the all inclusive place. What was it called then? D- drunk. No. <laughs> I can't remember. What Club Met. Yeah, Club Met. Yeah. So I don't go. I go to Bolivia to help this priest who led BJ. Now he has a mission in Bolivia, South America. And my friends are going like, yeah, Bolivia is where the cocaine is from. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're going to help oh, a yeah, priest. Bob, Bob is going yeah, to you're gonna help this on priest. a mission. So I go, I was with Mick. This little baby dies in my arms from dirty water. Yeah. Bury him in a lettuce box. And I get... And I said, Father William, Sister Columbo was there. Yeah. The big girl. What's yeah, her name? Uh, Lourdes. Sister Lourdes. Sister Lourdes. These nuns were like the holiest people. Whenever people go into Catholic bash, I'm like, shut up, man. <laughs> These are the holiest Christ following people. I know they have errant theology on Mary. Who cares? <laughs> so, um, so I end up staying there going back and forth. They were always broke. So I thought, you know, I could I have a gift to probably make some money. Why don't I do that? Make money, live down, which is what we've done for 30 plus years. Make a lot of money, live beneath it, you give a lot of money away, right? I think that when a man tells you, when he asks you to go with him one mile, go with him two. If he asks you for a Coke, give him your shirt as well. I can mean, go do 50. Do not store up your treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt and thieves break in and steal. Store up your treasures in heaven for where your treasures are. There will your heart be also. It's, there's a 500 verses to give up your stuff. And I just, I'm not better than anyone, but I really thought that through that if you... You tied your first dollar and then capped your income, right? And so what, whatever that number is, it's a different number for everybody. So, and then that frees up a lot of capital to do good stuff, right? When you go before the Lord, he's not going to say, you're not, you're not going to feel good about that third house you bought, man. I'm just telling you. <laughs> or how about this song? I surrender 10%. I surrender 10%. Ten for Jesus, the rest for me. I surrender ten percent. Like ten, so you make a million dollars, you keep nine hundred. Like, where's Jesus in that? And that's kind of how we're doing it here in the U.S., right? With a lot of exceptions, and people need to hear that. I mean, uh, it's, like it's a radical theory, but it shouldn't be, right? We got to internalize the scripture more, right? Where you live, like a bunch of things are off the table for when Jesus, right? Where you live, right? what school your kids go to, all these things. Like, we don't put Jesus in that equation. We do what everyone else is doing. We go where it's best and safest for us, which is like the antithesis of what Bonhoeffer does. They go back to yeah. Germany, Mother Teresa in India, and on and on and on, right? They go where it's bad. So, um, or if you're not doing that, you got to dig in and find out who's doing that and support them big time, right? And find, get behind those people because you can be lonely out there and one of the things that we've discovered through this whole process of walking through, all of us have some sort of an addiction, in case you're interested. <laughs> Everyone has some addiction going on here. Um, and 
there's a thing I used to do when I was a uh, worker at the rookies from uh, baseball camp. I would talk about all men need affirmation, affection, and attention. Right? Affirmation, affection, and attention. If they don't get that, they get angry. And it's interesting to see how we plumb the world to make fill our cup, right? And we avoid having people know that we're living in a persona. How's it going? Everything's fine, man. I feel really good about myself. I think business is good. Everything's happening great. I'm really feeling good about myself. Well, that's bullshit for the most part. And so until we kind of, as, as friends, we can kind of put aside the idea of persona pretending and allow us to get into a deeper relationship with each other, we can actually call each other on stuff and support each other in our crises. I remember my wife saying, Bobby was just new to us. They just crises. In crisis, right. right. Crises is pure plural. Thank you. I got that. <laughs> so we were just married, and my wife says, honey, you know, Bobby's been on our couch for two or three weeks now. Don't you think you should move on to another place? But friends, do not, I, I've had some very bitter experiences with being an overly loving friend. I can... I wanted to make that person sane or sober. or I was going to do whatever I could. I would overlook stuff. I became a chief enabler for a number of people. I had to learn what it meant to let go and to really love them and let them make a decision by themselves. And I often will say this, ask you this question. That the opposite of love is what? Hate. What, hate? Control. Apathy? Fear. 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 The opposite of love is control. That when Jesus is at Gethsemane, he gives up control. Father, if possible, take this bitter cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He gives up control. On the cross, you're, pretty, you're pinned to a cross. You know, you're giving up a lot of control here, right? You got a lot of control. And even it says in Hebrews that Jesus learned obedience through suffering. Our Lord, our incarnate Savior, learned obedience obedience through suffering. But it's interesting for me to see how we, as friends, walk through crises together, and out of that crisis comes opportunities to serve and to become extraordinary friends with one another. You walk together in people's darkness, limitations, their pain. Uh, every year I take a group of guys to, the, to a monastery. This, this summer will be my 39th annual retreat to the monastery. You've been there, Bob. Yeah, and Keddie, Keddie's been there five or six years now in a row. He's been there with me. And it's friends walking through life together. We're in crisis in some ways. Some are older than the others. But we try to grow together in crisis and help each other grow together in a way that allows us to see ourselves for who we really are. Yeah, so I would say that's 35 years, Beach, actually. So I would, I've talked to him at least once a month, maybe sometimes five times a week yeah. for 35 years. So you can't make new old friends. You know, you guys have sayings like that. But it's, real, it's like, a, like a meeting. Like it's, we don't bullshit. It's right. Yeah. And, uh, that enabling thing, right? So gift of compassion versus the people-pleasing alcoholic who had to buy around for the whole bar, act like a big shot, right? Yeah. Walter and I were talking about, are we enabling these kids? Are we, are we running a great benevolent ministry? Or are we just Christian welfare, right? It's a hard thing to say, right? So... Uh, there's a balance, and I, I don't do it right a lot. So, uh, but I would always think better to err on the side of grace, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the scripture says that you know, if you don't, you're like a clanging symbol if you don't have love. So um, I think that, and you got to go, like BJ's been really inconvenienced me, and you've got me in some pretty crazy stuff too. Right? <laughs> and so now the, the teacher, Right, as right. being helped by the men. It's like if he needs help with something, or well, I'm good for you know. I'll figure out how to do it, or get other guys to help with it financially, right. or any for in his ministry, or something going on. This is the best way to. Father William, who was my mentor, wrote me a, a letter one time. He was a monk at the monastery. Dear BJ, my student, my teacher, my friend. And so that's the idea yeah. of friendship: is that we're each other's students, each other's teachers, each other's friends. My student, my teacher my friend. So I might always be Bhagwan, and you always might be young Jedi. Grasshopper. But, yeah, grass, young grasshopper. 
But it's the idea that we grow together in a way that allows other people to see Christ in us, the hope of glory. But you do it together, and, and there are some times when it, it doesn't work. It's frustrating. You get, it's sorrowful for me to see it. Someone that relapses, and you can't make a difference in that person's life. And I've had to deal with a lot of guilt and shame over those issues. How in the heck did I let that guy do that? Well, well that's called control. He had to make his own decision. He had to make up his own mind. I couldn't get sober for him. I couldn't be celibate for him. I couldn't be whatever he was struggling with for him. But I wanted to be. I yeah. wanted to be the hero. I wanted to be the friend that says, I got your back for no matter what. And the more I did that, the sorrow got deeper because he, wasn't, he didn't turn any corners. Why didn't he need to turn any corners? Because his best buddy was sitting there and bailing him out. Kind of you know, like Michael Cohen, the fixer. I was kind of like the fixer guy. And finally, I got caught by the Holy Spirit and would say, I can't do this anymore. And I'm sorry that I could not take you further than you needed to go. I couldn't do it. So, meet my wife at BJ's house. Um, this is like Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz meets Attila the Hun. <laughs> We're from a different planet. Second Walter. <laughs> so, shake hands and come out fighting for a knockdown. Go to go to a neutral corner. <laughs> so, uh, and then, and very quickly, I was in New York six months, and we moved to Chicago. She's a foreign currency trader. Chicago had an opportunity there. I just didn't want to be in New York, people, places, and things. It's a big place, but I could bump into a bar, you know, or bump into an old girlfriend or something like that. So, uh, we moved to Chicago, and. Um, took a rehab brownstone um, on Division and Sedgwick, and we came in from the lakeside, the moving truck. So Lincoln Park, if you know Chicago, is nice. And uh, I was sitting, I remember like yesterday, we moved the stuff in, and it was like three bedrooms, fireplace, two baths. In New York, it would have been 3,000. Chicago was like 600 at the time, right? It was cheap. So um, uh, we're sitting out, we had a deck, and I'm hitting that, it was, uh, May 1st, 1988, and I'm hearing, boom, and I'm thinking, this is a nice, patriotic neighborhood. <laughs> They're lighting off fireworks from Memorial Day. It's only May 1st. <laughs> and I went jogging the next morning, and I come around the bend, and that's 20 15-story buildings, Cabrini Green housing project, right around the corner, a block and a half away from our new house. So um, then the cops pulled me over and said, what are you, actually, they said, what the fuck? You doing? Yeah. And I said, I just moved here from New York. And I go, oh, this is Cabrini Green, man. Right. Which I didn't know what that was. And then I learned what it was. So. I get a call from Bob. Cabrini Green? Yeah, it's a housing project. It's like a. Really bad. Worst, yeah. One of the worst ones in the entire country. Yeah. yeah. It was. Yeah. Was. It's knocked down now. So, so I get a call from Bob. He says, hey, B, she says, I'm starting a little league in, in Chicago. I, you know. Oh, good, Bob. That's not a good idea. <laughs> Did not know what it was going to cost them. Yeah. Yeah. So we, I saw I had like eight or nine boys. I think I told the story this morning. But, um, I caught at Columbia freshman year. I played football and just baseball one year. And um, all you guys who are over 50, that's our game, right? Baseball. So I, um, I had seven or eight boys with Al Carter. I said uh, I had them put out 30 little flyers on the telephone pole saying, come to practice Saturday. I figure we'll get seven more kids. We'll have a team. And 300 boys show up. So, and we become, end up becoming the biggest urban little league in America. And it's, uh, they knocked the brain down, so we moved to the west side where we live now. We moved um, maybe 20 years ago because they were not, it was gentrifying to get knocked down. So. And then two years later, uh, he calls me and says, well, let's do that in New York. Yeah. And so we started the East Harlem Little League. Again, we, we put up the posters and flyers. Yeah, it was crazy. And uh, like 400 kids signed yeah. up. 112th in Madison. 112th in Madison. Yeah. And only, and there was only 14 intact families. That yeah. Was, uh, 40 kids. Yeah, we're open up. Giuliani came, right? So that's how right. old this is, right? right? Bunch of baseball players, Kevin right. Mom, bunch of Yankees. It's pretty crazy. We're just throwing it together. We yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and But the, our fields, we kind of pride ourselves. Our fields are nice. Yeah. So, uh, like, make it good here. Let's, it's incarnational. Let's make it good here. So, uh, I remember Shakur and Dwayne Bell, who just had 25 years sober. Wow, that's great. And, um, the guys from Avenue D House Drug Rehab were the umpiring crew for the league. We made that one up to them. 
the community service. So they're shooting from building over here. Like Giuliani's gone now. It's game three. And they're shooting from this building over at people, like right over the field. Right. And, uh, and so I call timeout, and it's Shakur and Dwayne Bell. And they're like, they go, that's a, this, like a Glock 30. I don't even know what they're talking about. They're arguing about what caliber the gun is. <laughs> it's like between innings, and we just kept playing. And now it's a lot better than that. So, but everybody was in it. And it was a great thing about it, my friend Paul O'Connor, right. who you know, Walter, um, he uh, has three legal foster boys, and he's had a couple others. Um, but he was breaking up with his wife. I called him up because I needed coaches when I was 300 coaches. Anybody I knew, I called up. You got to coach a team. So I go, how's Holly? I've been with him. She's a Columbia girl also. He goes, that's a soft subject, but she just left me. So being the sensitive guy that I am, I said, well, you got plenty of time now. Why don't you come out coaching? <laughs> <laughs> Keep your mind off it, which he did. End of the season, I'm seeing Holly out there behind coaching third base with a pencil behind her ear, bringing pizza out to the boys through the playoffs. And, uh, and then about 15 years ago, their, two, their foster boys read from the Bible at Columbia's campus, St. Paul's Chapel, to renew all their vows because yeah. she fell back in love with the guy. It wasn't about the portion of money. It was about the guy's heart. And they are great people. Big I talk to Paul all the time. And so uh, that's just an example of where, you know, we, our wives and spouses that don't necessarily want that. Some, like, once you start giving them some stuff, though, they want it. <laughs> yeah. They get accustomed to this. But uh, they really want to be led into ministry like that, I think. And, uh, you know, I'll butt heads with my wife on a, on a lot of issues, but I think they won't. You know, she'll say to other people that, and Sheila will say they want their, their right. man to lead, but they don't tell us that. <laughs> well, but, your buddy's Vinny. That nine, the, yeah. So this is a part of part of this whole thing is that in crisis, in addiction issues, the more we can kind of be friends with one another. You don't have to heal each other. You can just be available to each other, and that spirit is the, the healing balm as you kind of show up and be part of each other's lives. And and that the, these crises that we go through should not be gone through alone. The idea of NCS and AA is that don't do, don't do life alone. Don't do that alone. And too often that guys isolate, right? And your buddy Vinny, uh, was it Vinny up alone? Yeah, I was just down at Vinny Abate. Right, right. Yeah. So the East Harlem Little League, it's Dominican, mostly Dominican, it's good ball. I mean, they take it seriously. So uh, <laughs> our league was mostly African-American. We were faster, but they were better at baseball. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> So Vinny is one of the drug rehab guys who played football at Ithaca College, big, funny Italian guy from Brooklyn. And um, he was one of the guys coming out. He would get, he was working downtown. I, I got him sober. He was in four rehabs. And he said, I thought that's what they meant by keep coming back. <laughs> <laughs> so he got it, and the fourth one's a charm. Uh, you know, back on Wall Street, back on his feet, digging this little league thing because he's a baseball nut. And um, so he's kind of bankrolling the little league. And he would have a, a limo from his, you know, remember Garvey, all those companies, brokerage companies would take, their job is to get you the Yankee tickets, Ranger tickets, the limos. So he's having the guys from Avenue D House picked up in limos to go umpire. It's a beautiful This thing. is a rehab center. <laughs> On the company. Yeah. I don't know if that's a legitimate expense. <laughs> so uh, I, Friday, September 7th, 2001, I'm I call up Vinny. I'm going to, Vinny, I'm going to be in New York. Let's go to the Yankee game. See, Little League's over. It's Little League season. So we'll, he says, well, why don't you, um, I have an AA meeting at five in one room, one conference room, and a Bible study in the other. Which one do you want to do? I'm like, Vinny, can you do that at work on Wall Street? He goes, what an 800-pound gorilla is he? Anything they want. I'm in charge. He goes, besides, half the trading floors in the program. <laughs> And this is Friday, and he says to me this, just busting my balls. Hey, Bobby, when we get to heaven, can we take the money with us? And he hangs up the phone. So I'm boarding Tuesday, September 11th to go to New York. They say, everybody get off the plane. I'm standing at the bar, ironically, at, at Midway, watching the second plane hit, the other tower. And I was supposed to chair the meeting at Cantor on the 105th floor. So I was supposed to chair the AA meeting at Cantor Fitzgerald on the 105th floor, and Vinny and everybody got killed. They all got killed. Everybody that was going to be at that evening got killed. So, uh, but the last thing he said to me was that when we get to heaven, can we take the money? With us? <laughs> I was there a couple weeks ago. So have you, if you haven't seen the memorial to 9/11, it's spectacular. My son's a fireman in New York City, and 
uh, the firefighter families before the public got in were able to go down and go through the whole museum. It was a very powerful experience. Yeah, so our time, like, get a buddy, right? It's, this is old stuff. Get a sponsor, get a buddy that you're close to that could really tell him every, like you could tell him your shit, right? And, uh, and then you have to count on him to not tell anybody, right? Because yeah. that happens, right? It does happen. Like, how the hell did he know that? <laughs> Who told you? So, uh, the leak, the WikiLeaks, what do you call WikiLeaks? So, and, um, and it could be a bunch of guys. I, I got to tell you, though, the meeting this morning, uh, whenever I'm at a meeting, so I still go, and people go, you still need to do that? I'm like, yeah, 33 years, I, I think I'll keep going, right? right? So, because uh, I'm weak. <laughs> I'm not strong like you, I'll keep going. But I'm, I'm loving it. Like, I'm in the room. I got a lot of years just loving being with you and you and yeah, you guys at the meeting. It was great. I mean, it's... I take friends for open meetings of AA, and it's like they go church and be like this. Yeah. So, um, and our so, I mean, little league starts. We start having a bunch of kids ourselves. Uh, missed that birth control section of the Bible. <laughs> oh, it's not in there. Sorry. <laughs> Nine kids. So, well, plus four. No. So, uh, and he lost two children. Yeah. We start the uh, school. We will buy a local Catholic school. I just sold the business, and I was the first downstroke, and then I was in way over my head. And so we opened Chicago Hope Academy. It's the only Christian high school in the city limits. So it would be like a little Wheaton Academy only with fast kids. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we open. This is year 14. It's imperfect, but Walter's my right hand. become a dear friend helping um, really – Maybe save the day at Hope. But, uh, so 260 kids. Yeah. Um, high school. Uh, high school kids. Yeah. Hopefully it's going to be a grade school eventually. Yeah. So we're building a new campus. When you go on the Eisenhower, you see the giant Hope sign there. That's the back of our school. Yeah. So great little school, bad neighborhood. Um, we, we're going to build a new high school and do the K-3. So we uh, really strong. We're Final Four in boys basketball, which in Chicago is a big deal. And um, like it's basketball central. There's 45 NBA guys from Chicago. That's a lot. So, uh, and it's bad for the kids because they think they're going to do that. I'm like, you're not going to do that. Take the electrician's test. <laughs> so, well, you're working on your jump shot. You're 30, like, <laughs> you know. So, the, the idea is that when we are clearly willing to be together, to live in honesty, openness, and transparency, to help each other in crisis, to love each other when maybe we're not so lovable, that love where, we talk, where, where it talks about in uh, John, it says that the world would know that you're my disciples by the love you have for each other. And out of that, now here's what happens. Out of that friendship in crisis, out of that friendship in dealing with addiction, out of that flows rivers of living water. So he's talking about a school, but there was also a rehab farm yeah, in downstate, downstate yeah. Illinois. Our fellowship has launched over 25 different ministries, and each ministry has emanated out of friendship. Yeah. Each one. So you don't, no, he doesn't bail me out of jail. There's no hope. There's no Little League. <laughs> yeah. There's none of that stuff. Like, all those things are tied together, right? Yeah, they are. I definitely would have bet, wouldn't have bet on me, for sure. Yeah, well, that's the same with me. I, I was 26 years old when I came to Christ. No one was betting on me. No, my mother dutifully <laughs> loved me. But she wasn't betting on me, right? So with hair down to my shoulders and a free angel of Davis button on, pocket full of drugs, and a woman I was living with who's kind of my personal recreational center, you know, I walked out to this monastery to buy a loaf of bread. That's all I did. Just because they sold bread on Saturdays, and my mother loved that bread, and... I wanted to keep at least one relationship intact, so I wanted to buy a loaf of bread for my mom. So as I was walking out of that monastery, this old monk from down at the bottom, Father Matthias, who you knew very well, he said, hey, you look interesting. What are you all about? Now, Kenny's been at the monastery, so he knows what that means. I said, F you, you Catholic, colonialist, imperialist pig. What do you care? <laughs> he laughed. And you know what he did? This is very cool. He befriended me. He didn't judge me. He didn't scorn me. He didn't mock me. He didn't tell me to get my life together. He befriended me. 
he became an example, an icon, an, uh, an attraction to the gospel of Christ. So if I ask you this question, we all know what the, what the fruit of the spirits are, right? The fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, Self-control. Well, what's the fruit of the fruit? What manifests itself out of that living in the spirit? What is that? Humility. That's right, Kenny. So humility is the great attraction to the gospel. For Jesus humbled himself before the cross. And that humility brings people to a place to ask the question, which I did, because I could feel that Father Matthias didn't have an agenda for me, except I, can knew, I didn't know anything about God or Jesus. I just knew that he, he knew something. It was his humility that brought me to the place asking this question after three hours of me berating him. I said, well, derisively, what are you all about, Father? He said, I'm about Jesus Christ. He's Lord and God of my life. And I'm here to serve him and to pray for people. I said, oh, God. Stupid. I said, okay, I get the Lord part, like Lord Krishna, you know, like the Beatles. <laughs> my good Lord, oh my Lord, like Lord Krishna, right? But I never got to, I never got to a place. And, and I said, I don't buy the God thing. And he, then he looked at me, and here's why we are standing here together right now. He says, you, of course you believe that he's God, BJ, because it's only God in Christ that could die for your sins and the burdens that you were carrying. Well, my countenance changed. It was a spirit moment in my life. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't have any words to describe, but something was going on. I said, well, how do you get this? And he reached into his tunic and turned to the New Testament, to Hebrews 11, 1. It said, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And that was my moment where I said, now what? So you make an act of contrition and invite Christ into your life. And that's what I did. But I didn't do that out of dogma or sin or guilt. I did that because I could tell this man wanted to love me. He was, he was a humble man trying to love me. And so things started to change. The very next night, I go home that night to my live-in girlfriend and says, hey, baby, you can't believe what happened. It's like far out. I mean, it's like God and Jesus and this monk and bread and the bread of life and Jesus. It was really far effing out, man, you know? Well, she moves out the next day, right? No kidding. Yeah. So I started to get wounded because I'm used to having sex whenever I want to sex. My pussy recreational center, right? So two or three days without sex is really a problem. So I head back to the monastery. At 26, I mean. That's at 26. Well, I could go two or three days now. I know. Thanks, brother. <laughs> As a matter of fact, everybody here has just done that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, you got it. Hopefully. So I go back to the monastery, and I went to the monastery every weekend for three months. And then I was on the Dubuque rugby team, and the first rugby game of the season, I blow my knee out. I was selected to go to New Zealand that May. This is uh, uh, March of, of um, 74. I'm sitting in the hospital, my knee being repaired, and the old monk comes to the hospital. And he says, I said, Father Matthias, I said, this, my life, my identity was in rugby. This was my life. I just... And he said, look to the book of Hosea, chapter 6. And here's what he read. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has broken you in order to restore you. You have been wounded so that he might bind up your wounds. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he's coming forth as sure as the dawn. He will come to you on the second day, nay, on the, like on the third day, like the rising sun. Come. Let us return to the Lord. And then here is the, here is the moment where my life turned in a dime. He said, BJ, would you like to convalesce at the monastery? I said, yes, I would. And I lived there for five and a half years. So it was a long convalescent, my friends. Addiction, 
But the big, the power of all this is about the power of God's love manifested in friendship in my crisis. I was in crisis. I had an addiction issue, and I was in crisis. And I was met not with dogma, not with rules, not with the idea you don't get laid, you don't get high, you don't go back and do bad things, but I was met with, I love you. It's going to be okay. Come unto me, or you are heavy laden. Come unto me. And that's what broke the back of all these issues in my life. Um, 79, I moved to New York City, and I've been there for the last 40 years. The Shepherd of Times Square. That was his, <laughs> they did a story on Bijan. So, any, look, uh, a lot of the stuff you guys do, know from the program about getting a sponsor and all that kind of stuff, but I would hear, if, you get, if we get anything, I know Chicago guys, pretty tight group, right? Everybody, so, mm -hmm. but, but everybody, is, a, is everybody here like a veteran of the group, or you got some newcomers? And, that's a yeah. So you want to lock into them, right? That's the most, in AA we say that's the most important guy in the room, the, the brand new guy who's just staggered in. So, uh, and then, you know, we're wise old guys, right? right. We've got a lot to offer. We're not the, like retirement. You're going to move to Florida, wear your pants up to here. You've got to get in the fight. <laughs> There's no mention of retirement in the Bible, no. right? We're supposed to get in it. You'll know when you're supposed to back off, right? I'm working on my succession plan, but um, we should be there for the young people, and they're kind of hungry for it, right? They're not. They act like they might act like swell, but I, and all these people say millennials. This, they're all different. There's some who are rock solid, some are not. Some are, you know, the tech is killing us. I think. Yeah. So we, um, you know, so what we run at school. We take the phones out. You got home. It's discipleship group. Your phone goes in that box in glass with your name on it. Boom. You don't see it for the rest of the day. And, and that's good. <laughs> the Lord said that is good because the tech's killing us. But get, and it doesn't have to be alcohol and drugs. It's like dramatic. When you're doing heroin, you know you're messed up, right? So, I mean, that's an easy one. When you're, when you're doing other stuff or just snorting coke and putting acid in it and snorting it like I used to do that, and you've got a problem. So it's almost worse when you don't have an addiction, right? When you don't have an addiction like that's blatant like that, everything seems fine. But you might have something else, right? Uh, well, here's a little what I call a spiritual uh, health checklist. Can you just pass these up to everybody, please? Over here, just pass these up to the side. Something to take with you and to look at. Um, Father William, who's been dear to me, we've kind of been working on this idea about how we're supposed to help each other along and, and to be honest about our spiritual journeys. And this has been for me a pretty health, uh, this is kind of what I've been doing and trying to become aware of uh, taking time to rest. And the longer I can take my little naps in the afternoon, I'm better that night. The more I can kind of uh, retreat two or three times a year, the better I am when people come into my life. And so, could you give me my, that one copy there, Frank? Yeah. Thank you so much. So, thanks, brother. So I just, um, you can read it yourself. I, I, would just, I just want to do, I want to do one thing about prayer. I want to say one thing about prayer and dealing with the issues of crisis, friendship, addiction. Now in AA they say you take 20 minutes each in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening, pray to whomever you think of God is, I, whatever. But we're here because we're in a Christ consciousness relationship. But there's a number of different kinds of prayers. There's a prayer petition. Um, there's prayer of praise. Now, I don't know if that music that you're hearing has anything to do with praising. I don't know. I, not my style. I, I, I prefer to hear the, the uh, Hymn of the Cherubim by Krakowski. That kind of gives me a little deeper sense of, of who God is. But it works for some people, and sometimes I can get through that. But there's praise music, and there is um, prayers of supplication. We're broken hearted. There's prayers of um, intimacy with God and prayers of meditation, what you read in scriptures. Try this verse. Here's a great verse, one of the verses I 45, 46 years ago lived in. For I desire to know nothing more than Christ and him crucified. And then ask yourself this question rhetorically. Oh, really? Is that what, is that what I want? For me to live as Christ to die is gain. Oh, 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 really? Is that what I want? So I want to just enter it, want you to enter into the monastery just for a moment with me, and I want to help you with something. 
because it's been part of my life for my whole 46 years as a follower of Christ. In Philippians it says that every knee shall bow in heaven and earth at the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow. Now I have kind of an odd theology, and if you guys know about theology, I, want, I need some correction on this, but I feel so strong about the name of Jesus that when someone takes the Lord's name in vain, like, Jesus Christ, I think the demons flee. I don't care. It doesn't make any difference that you say. I think, I think the demons say, don't say the name. Don't, you, don't say it. No, no. Had they known they crucified the Lord of glory, they never would have done it. So I think the name of Jesus is part of our most powerful aspect of who we can be as followers of Jesus Christ. And here's how it works. I'm just shut that door for just one minute. And I'm just going to give us a little bit of a, a contemplative experience here. A monastery experience, right? So all the, all the things in your brain, all the petitions that you have, every concern you have about your wife or money or the next position that you're having or a child or a friend or wherever, it's consumed in a, the Holy Spirit's desire to love you. Everything. There's nothing he doesn't know about you. Nothing. Everything, your concerns, your persona, the attitude, all that is known by God. Now I want you all to shut your eyes and, take, and just listen to me and take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. <coughs> Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Now I want you to recognize your heartbeat. Sink into your body and feel your heart beating. Feel it now, just feel it. Be aware of your heart beating. When's the last time you were aware of your heart beating? Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Every beat of your heart says the blessed name, Jesus. 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 Every knee shall bow, Jesus. Come unto me, Jesus. Jesus. Well, guys, that's just a short course of just kind of being aware of who you are. Let your solitude sink into your breathing, into your heart. Let your very heart say the blessed name. Invoke that. Picture the cross of Christ in your mind. Set your mind on the things that are above. In Genesis it says that the whole world was destroyed because man's imagination was on evil continually. And our world is such, filled with such distraction and such evil and pornography to bad music to everything else in between. You sit for 10 or 15 minutes. Remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. So these are 10 things that I try to do. I'm not saying I'm perfect. These are, I'm just saying that these are some suggestions for you. you. You might find your own way. You might find your own way to work through this and find a place for your own disciplines. And when you do that, you're going to have tremendous freedom. When Paul says, set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are below, we can become a tremendous vessel of hope and purpose for people in crisis. And we can call them friends. The Lord, the world will know that you're disciples of mine by the love you have for each other. And then Jesus tells us, I don't longer call you servants. I call you friends. That's all I have. <laughs> Any questions, you guys? Any thoughts on... Uh friendship with family members that uh, 
have addiction issues? I've done over 100 interventions in 40 years. Find someone who can do an intervention with you. I'll walk you through it, how it works. Yeah. Where do you live? North Carolina. Okay. So, so um, we've done the intervention, and they're coming out of a three-month Okay, so process, three you're months. just going to have to go to Al-Anon meetings and make sure that you don't try to control that person's life. Get re they have to be on their own program. They have to make their own decisions. Muzz, you have a thought on that? Yeah, I mean, so you go to treatment, right? And then imagine somebody goes to treatment, you got to come out eventually, right? You know, so then you got to find out where the meetings are and all of a sudden it's just, I tell people half facetiously, like if I went to Moscow and I called up AA, somebody would come pick me up that doesn't even know me and take me to them. Yep. I mean, it's the most ex costly, you know, club in the world that costs us everything to join, right? So whoever went to that is in a treatment center, but you got to just gather around them. And they should be, like I was talking this morning about being out of the closet for that. I mean, if you're having a problem, I, I'm really for that. Like, you tell everybody, uh, maybe you can at work or something, but I tell almost anybody who wants to hear it that I'm an alcoholic and an addict. That's like one more guy I can't drink with, right? <laughs> so I'm like, I'm not shy about it. So, yeah. um, because then when you go to some club med, if you tell everybody that, they're going to be looking out for you. Yep. You know? That's right. That's the bold step, right? When you come out of the closet for Jesus and for sobriety, and you know, and then you have, and here's why I think we're so weak in this country, and things are going the way they're going, is because we're not we're not doing what we're supposed to do. So we don't want to look like hypocrites and tell anyone else that we don't do shit. Right? <laughs> we don't want to look like a hypocrite because we're banging some or or whatever, whatever. So we don't want to tell anyone else because we're not holding the standard, right? And, we don't, and we're not being that good of an example. And I'm not either. I blow it every freaking day. But I think we have to get, you have to keep getting up and get out of it, right? I mean, we're the Jesus gang. That's who we are. We're the Jesus gang. We've got to act like them, right? We're like, oh, we're afraid of stuff. We shouldn't be afraid of anything, right? We're going to die anyway. <laughs> What's going to happen? Like, the atheists are going to laugh at us. They're laughing at us anyway. <laughs> Might as well go out and make a big, giant mistake. <laughs> Amen, brother. Anything else? Anybody else? Just stick with it. You know, it's a, um, it's a, it's a sojourn. It's a journey. It's um, an adventure. Um, yeah, it's a quest. All of the above. And uh, here's what I tell to Bob's point. Here's what I tell someone say, "What's it going to cost me, BJ? Up to and including your life. That's what it costs us to follow Jesus." So each of you will have your own venue, your own journey. You'll reach people differently. There's no formula for this except to be available, open, honest, and transparent. Just do that. You're going to see a lot of good things happen. All right? So Kenny, why don't you uh, close in prayer for us, brother?